This is the second video in the series on production functions, where in the first one we've seen the general properties of uh, the production function that is mostly used in the literature, and we've seen some illustrations and intuition behind this general description of the production function. In this video now we go a little bit more into the details and impose some structure on the production function and uh, describe the so-called constant elasticity of substitution production function, a CES production function, that is used in most economic models. The specific form of the CES production function is as follows. We have output here on the left hand side, and we have the two production factors, capital and labor here on the right hand side. Remember that we've normalized productivity to one. And we have a number of parameters actually that describe how these two production inputs translate into output. The first one is alpha. That's basically the share of the two production factors in final output. So basically alpha determines the share of capital and one minus alpha is then the share of labor. Rho in turn, which is this exponent here, determines the substitutability between capital and labor in production. And sigma would be 1 over 1 minus rho uh, and is the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. So here we see immediately that if rho becomes closer to 1, then the elasticity of substitution is higher. So these two production factors are then easier to substitute. And if rho is lower, so closer to minus infinity, this becomes uh, smaller and smaller, and it's more and more difficult to substitute these two parameter values. In general, the range of values that rho can attain is from minus infinity to plus one. And then we have psi, which is the last parameter here, and this parameter determines the returns to scale. If xi is smaller than 1, there are decreasing returns to scale. So if I double both uh, input factors, capital and labor, I can produce less than twice the amount. If xi is greater than 1, then I have increasing returns to scale, meaning that if I double capital and labor, then I can produce more than twice uh, the output as before. And in case of xi equal to 1, I have constant returns to scale, meaning that if I double capital and labor, I also double output. From now on, we focus on the constant elasticity case, xi equal to 1. In the case of constant returns to scale, xi is equal to 1. So in the exponent, in the numerator, we have 1 here. And a rho, the other parameter, determines the elasticity of substitution. It can attain values going from minus infinity to 1. And we have basically the following cases, the following polar cases, or um, three main cases. If rho goes to minus infinity, then the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor goes to zero. And capital and labor are perfect complements. This is the case of a Leontief production function. In this case, we cannot substitute capital for labor and vice versa. And if we increase only one of the production factors, we cannot produce more. So the other one is the limiting factor, basically. If rho tends to one, then the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor tends to infinity, which means that capital and labor are perfect substitutes. In this case, we have a linear production function and we can substitute capital for labor perfectly. And then we have an intermediate case in which rho goes to zero and then the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is equal to one. And that's the case of a Cobb Douglas production function where capital and labor can be substituted to the degree that the elasticity of substitution is equal to one. And whenever the elasticity of substitution is greater than one, we speak of K and L as being gross substitutes. And if the elasticity of substitution is smaller than one, we say that capital and labor are gross complements. Before I describe the different cases in more detail, I have here a general illustration of a CS production function for the parameter xi is equal to 1, so constant returns to scale. Rho is equal to 0.1, which means that the two production factors are gross substitutes, actually. That means they are easier to substitute than in the Cobb-Douglas case. The alpha parameter is equal to 1 
third, so the share of capital would be one third, the share of labor two thirds, and we vary K and L. So it looks like in the general case of the production function where I have such, had such an illustration, we have here capital on the x-axis, uh, labor on the y-axis and output on the z-axis. We see if we do not employ production factors, we cannot uh, produce at all. If we employ only one production factor, the same holds true. So we have to employ both production factors. Along this line here, uh, we would have the constant returns to scale. So we increase both production factors and can increase uh, output by the same amount. And uh, as we will see on the next uh, slide, we can cut the production function here and here to have a partial look at it. What happens if we only increase one of the two production factors and hold the other constant? This is done here. Now we have the same parameters as before, but we fix labor and only vary the capital stock. For the particular case that we've drawn before, what we see is that if we do not employ any capital, we cannot produce. The first unit of capital increases output by quite a bit, and then it levels off. So we have a positive but decreasing marginal uh, product with respect to capital. And this particular case actually fulfills the in other conditions. Let's start the illustration of the special cases with the linear production function, or the case in which uh, rho tends to 1, such that the elasticity of substitution tends to infinity, and capital and labor become perfect substitutes. We've already seen that in this case, you have a linear production function, and we can now draw the so-called um, isoquants of the linear production function. That means the number of uh, workers and the amount of capital that is needed to produce a certain amount of output. And we see that this moves along a straight line. So that means at all of these points, we can substitute capital and labor according to the ratio given by these shares, alpha and one minus alpha. But it's always kind of a perfect type of substitution that I need a certain amount of labor to substitute for a certain amount of capital, and this is possible. How does the production function itself look like? Now here we have the three-dimensional case again, where we have capital on the x-axis, labor on the y-axis, and output on the z-axis here, and we see that the production function is actually a plane here. So that means I can perfectly substitute capital and labor at each of these points uh, at this plane. What we also see is that we can produce output with one production factor only. So here, for example, output is positive, although we don't employ any labor. And here along this line, output is positive, although we would not employ any capital. So that means the two are perfectly substitutable here. Now we again hold one of the two production factors fixed and plot the two-dimensional uh, partial production function there. And here we again hold a labor constant at uh, the amount of three. We again have alpha is equal to one third and we vary the capital stock K. We see that output can be produced, of course, and the increase is always constant. So it does not diminish. We have a linear production function and we can substitute capital perfectly by labor. So this would actually mean that we do not have a diminishing marginal product and this production function would not fulfill the properties of a neoclassical production function. What we also see is that the slope of this line depends on uh, alpha because alpha determines how much uh, capital I need to compensate for one unit of labor. Now let's come to the special case of a Leontief production function, which we get when we let rho tend to minus infinity such that the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor tends to zero, and capital and labor become perfect complements. So in this case we cannot increase output by increasing just one of the two production factors. And we have a Leontief production function that looks like this here. We have output on the left hand side, and output is determined actually by the lower amount of input um, of the two production factors, capital and labor. 
So here, if we increase k but let l constant, then actually l sets the limit for what can be produced. So the minimum actually of the two inputs. How would the isoquants look like in this case? Well, they would have a right angle here and be two straight lines, one horizontal and one vertical. And that means that we cannot substitute capital by labor and vice versa. So if we want to produce a certain amount of output here, if we let L increase, that would not increase output at all. And if we let K increase, that would also not be the case. And we cannot substitute the two, basically. How does the production function look like in this case? We have here the three-dimensional illustration. Again, on the x-axis we have capital, on the y-axis labor, on the z-axis output. And we see here that uh, the shape of the production function is such that we cannot increase output by just increasing capital here. So that would still be all the same level. We cannot increase output by increasing labor here for a fixed capital. So this would also, again, still be the same level. We can only increase output by increasing both capital and labor. Now we come again to the two-dimensional description where we have the Leontief production function for alpha equal one-third, fixed L equal to three, and varying capital. We see that if we start with a low capital stock and L is fixed to three, then if we increase K, we can only always produce as much output as uh, the given capital stock uh, allows us for the given alpha. And once we reach uh, the point where now the restricting factor becomes labor, then the production function becomes a flat horizontal line. And increasing K further does not increase output further. Now again, clearly, this case of the CS production function again does not fulfill the properties of a neoclassical production function. It does not have strictly positive marginal products, and also the in other condition is not necessarily fulfilled, is not fulfilled here. Finally, we come to the Cobb Douglas production function. This is obtained when we consider the case where rho tends to zero, such that the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is equal to one. And then we have the Cobb Douglas case with the Cobb Douglas production function as written down here, where on the left hand side we have output. On the right hand side we have capital to the power of alpha. So now alpha turned into the elasticity of output with respect to capital input. And labor has an exponent of 1 minus alpha. So 1 minus alpha is the elasticity of output with respect to labor input. The isoquants look like the one that is plotted here which are bulged towards the origin. And that, in the end, implies that we can substitute capital for labor along this line with an elasticity of substitution that is equal to one. And in absolute terms, it means that if the capital stock is high in production and labor is low, then we can replace a lot of capital by employing just a little bit more of labor. And if, by contrast, labor in production is high and the capital stock is low, we can reduce labor quite substantially by increasing capital by just a little bit. The production function in the three-dimensional case looks very much as before in the general case of a CS production function, uh, only with the difference that I did not choose rho equal to 0 0.1 but rho equal to zero. And we also see the same effects here. So we have that without labor, we cannot produce. Without capital, we cannot produce. And we get uh, the situation that we have uh, constant returns to scale here along if we increase both of these um, uh, production uh, factors. And we see that if we have one production factor equal to zero and increase it slightly, then the slope here is rather high. And this can also be seen if we uh, analyze this uh, production function for a fixed uh, amount of labor equal to three, then we see here that the slope of the production function is very steep at the origin. So if we increase k, then we can produce quite a lot for the first unit of k, and then it flattens off again. Now this production function, a Cobb-Douglas production function, fulfills 
the properties of a neoclassical production function. It has positive but diminishing marginal products in with respect to both uh, input factors, capital and labor, and it fulfills the NADA conditions. And that's the reason for perhaps why it is um, such an important and prominent production function in macroeconomic models. In the next part, I will go into the details of the Cobb-Douglas um, uh, case and analyze how the marginal product changes, um, how the factor shares uh, change if we have perfect competition, and so on and so forth.